Malcolm Gladwell has joined me. We, I think, have the same hair. Good to speak to you, Malcolm. You're right. Yeah. Uh, I think they are, that our hair has uh, different origins, but yes, I think the outcome is the same. <laughs> we ended up in the same place, and isn't that a nice metaphor for America? <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> I have a Sicilian background. What's the origin of your hair? And I'll try to figure out the origin of my hair. My mom is Jamaican, so my curls come by way of Africa. Your curls come by way of Southern Europe. Yes. That's the difference. But here we are. But here we are. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. Let's talk about the uh, audio book, uh, Audio Biography, The Miracle and Wonder, Conversations with Paul Simon, who, um, uh, tell us how this whole thing came about. Well, we wanted to do, you know, I started this audio company with my friend Jacob, and we wanted to do interesting things with audio. And it struck me that one of the interesting things you could do is do a biography of, of a musician um, that would be way more fun than a written biography of a musician. You know, I read lots of musici- musician biographies, not autobiographies, and I always have this moment of frustration, which is these are people who live with their voices and with the sounds that they make, and I can't hear them. So I thought, let's try something where Let's try and make a new kind of biography where we just sit down with a musician and talk to them and have them play for us and play music with them. And and then the next idea was, well, who would we start with? And um, I went to see Jodi Gerson at Universal and asked her that question. And she said, well, Paul Simon, of course, which um, she was absolutely right. You know, duh, that is the right place to start with, you know, the, the, the brainiest the the most thoughtful, the one of the most remarkable songwriters of his generation, and a talker. You mm-hmm. need to have a talker. If you're going right. to do a model where you, we sat down with him for 40 hours, there actually aren't a lot of people who can be interesting for 40 hours. I'm not sure I can be interesting for 40 hours. <laughs> We're going to find what? out on today's <laughs> extended podcast. I hope you packed I the lunch. You, 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 I believe you can, Adam, but uh, I'm not so sure about myself. Uh, Paul Simon, yes. Interesting for 40. And now we don't, the book is only five hours. We take the best of the 40. Right. Five hours and six minutes to be precise. And by the way, it's available now on Amazon exclusively on audiobook. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm thinking Audible. of- Audible, Oh, yes. uh, on- uh, so it's not exclusively on, on audio. No, no, it's on book. Audible, and you oh, can also sorry. go to mir- miracleaudio.com and um, and download it directly from us. It's a yeah. It's only an audio book, though. There's no yeah. there's no print version. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm I misinformed on my cheat sheet here. So yeah, here's a kind of philosophical thing because you like this stuff. Um, I never learned to read, and so I became a kind of audible person. And maybe Uh one of the reasons I talk as much as I do or I got into the profession I ended up in is because I really couldn't read. I I know a lot of people, people in my family who love reading, but they don't love talking. (laughs) They love reading, you know, and... Wait, are you dyslexic? No, I I never learned to read. Wait, wait, hold on. I know how to read now. I I didn't learn when I was younger. Really? How is that possible? I mean... Absent a disability, you just weren't interested? Nobody took no, you by the hand? No. Where were you educated? In, in, <laughs> now I have all kinds of questions. What was happening in the Corolla household that little Adam was allowed to go out in the world without this most basic of skills? Well, it's it, it'll, it'll kind of make sense if I, if I walk you through it, how, how it panned out, I suppose. Okay. Um, I come from... My mom became sort of a hippie mom at some point. This is the early 70s, right? We're about the same age. And so she kind of got involved with this sort of movement, so to speak. Um, My dad was just a kind of guy from South Philly, a little bit of a pseudo intellectual and pretty much just sort of hands off. He just sort of, he was the guy who just sat and read a book on the sofa all Saturday. Not not the kind of throw the baseball around kind of kind of dad. So he was a little bit of a 
absentee dad, even though he didn't abandon the family. And my mom sort of took a turn for the sort of, uh, I don't know, she saw Roots and then she saw Billy Jack and it, it changed her worldview, you know. <laughs> Picture Roots meets Billy Jack. That would be, that would be my mom in the early 70s. Uh-huh. So she kind of decided, and there was a lot of this stuff that was going on. It's interesting, maybe something for us to get into. Um, now the schools are considered sort of the man because they're teaching CRT and, or allegedly, and the right is pushing back. Well, back in the 70s, it was considered the man and the hippies were pushing back. So it was a different group. The man was still the school, but my mom didn't like what she thought that the schools weren't teaching the right history or whatever. Just there was an authority, an issue with authority. I guess it was. So I went to a kind of a hippie free range kind of school at the early part of my career. And that those schools were about, making stuff out of clay, calling your teacher by their first name, having circles where the one guy would strum the guitar and you guys would sing, you know, the dreidel song, or you guys would sing. It wasn't a religious school, but you'd sing any folk song or Joni Mitchell, Joan Baez, whatever. And the curriculum was no curriculum. It was sort of kids are little adults. They're free to choose. If they don't want to read, they don't have to read. They, they want to run around and throw a dirt clod. They can run around and throw a dirt clod. So that's what it was. And, of course, I chose to throw a dirt clod versus learn to read. Mm-hmm. At some point, that ended, and I had to enter the fifth grade which was public school. And I had no idea how to read. I didn't know vowels and consonants. I, I didn't know uppercase, lowercase. I, I, I knew nothing. Verbs, I, nouns. I, I didn't know any. I knew as much as a feral child would know who was raised yeah. in the woods, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I was bright. I just had no concept of the language and reading and writing. Um, yeah. I was smart enough and I was completely and utterly humiliated that all the kids around me seemed to know how to read and they could go up to the chalkboard and write things on there. I was embarrassed. And so it was my like secret shame. I didn't want anyone to find out that I was, you know, quote unquote stupid, you know? Mm -hmm. So because I was bright enough, I could hide it, you know, and I could talk my way or I could make a joke about it and I could avoid it. And the L.A. Unified School System wasn't, you know, they weren't all heroes back then. Most of them just wanted to show up, get their paycheck, and go home. So they just kind of warehoused me and kind of pushed me through. I was able to fake it. And I ended up barely graduating high school and just walking onto a construction site. And I I never learned to read. And then I didn't have to read because I was on a construction site. And that was that. And I did at a certain point, I would have people come up to me and go, you're smart. I I don't get why you don't know. You don't, you must be dyslexic. That was the first thing out of your mouth. And I'd go, I don't think I'm dyslexic. I I just don't think I ever learned to read. And somebody said you should get tested and I got tested and I'm not dyslexic. I just never learned to read. Later on Uh in life, I got into radio and television and they kept handing me scripts and live reads and commercials. And at the beginning of my career, they'd go, oh, don't worry about it. It's all on the teleprompter. You're not going to have to rehearse. You know, I'd go, oh, on the teleprompter. Holy shit. (laughs) It's going to be horrible. So I learned to read probably after the age of 35, pretty much. Wow. Wow. That's kind of, I mean, you're right, though. It's as preparation for the world in which you chose to make your living in, it's kind of perfect. I mean, you put all your, you know, I'm reminded, I brought up dyslexia because in my uh, book, David and Goliath, I have this whole thing about how many successful people are dyslexic. And the reason, although you're not, is the same, which is that if I take away something valuable from your kind of arsenal of tools, 
there's two ways in which you can respond. One is you you just fail, you capitulate. You the other is that you massively compensate by pouring all of your putting all of your eggs in another basket and getting so the you know there's a huge number of dyslexic entrepreneurs and all of them I interviewed tons of them. They all tell exactly the same story which is when they were kids they got through school by cheating and by making friends with the smartest kid in the class. Now, so that's a very high-end problem solving that they're starting to do at the age of whatever, six or seven years old. So they go out into the real world and they want to get into business. And what are they really good at? High-end problem solving, making alliances with people, and figuring out strategies to get around existing structures. It's the perfect entrepreneur right. um, preparation, right? So you, you had the perfect radio preparation, which was all the time people were spending, your, your peers were spending, wasting their time on books. <laughs> Adam was chatting in the back, right? <laughs> that's that's uh, that's all I was doing. It was sort of like I don't know. People that go to prison miraculously learn how to paint real well. <laughs> you know, they become great yeah. artists because they're just that's what they're doing. They can't do other things. I could not read, so I yeah. talked and yeah. told stories yeah. and told jokes, and also I had to make people laugh to kind of deflect too a little bit to kind of get yeah. them all from looking too close. They had to know I was bright. I had to make them think I was funny and bright. So I would sort of deflect by telling so, jokes. So you're the, you are the, you are the ideal audience for everything that we do at Pushkin. You're, yes. you're basically, we should have a big picture of you on the wall and say, if we can reach Adam and the Adams of the world, <laughs> the, the children, we should, we should employ some market research firm to find all the children of hippie moms from the 70s, because that should be where we should start. <laughs> People who only want to listen. Well, they hate they their moms. That much I know. That much we have the hippie p kids have in common. But what I was leading to before we took oh. off on a history of me, which I feel somewhat ashamed of because I should be interviewing you. What I was saying is, is um, audio makes so much sense now because everyone is hiking, driving, waiting at an airport, standing in line somewhere. We're really the book, you know, it's kind of hard to hike and read a book at the same yeah. time. So because of the phone, it just completely and utterly makes sense to listen to the audio version of everything because you can be walking through a supermarket shopping. You couldn't do it with a book, but you can do it with your earbuds. Yeah. Yeah, I think I remember the moment when I was dry, riding the subway in New York, there was a moment when I feel like when I got to New York, everyone would be reading a book all around me in the subway car. And then literally within a two year period, everybody was on was listening to earphones mm -hmm. and on their phone. And it was that moment when I was like, oh, if I just write print books from now on, I'm gonna go out of business. Right. I you have know, you, Freakonomics, obviously. I have it on audio, and I would just hike around the neighborhood and and listen to it. Yeah. But what is the, your what is your backstory? What got you? Have a very interesting profession, not one that most people have. How did you? What led you to where you are? Uh, well, I was a newspaper reporter. Well, I I, I wanted to go into advertising out of college. And I, I, I applied to 21 advertising agencies and got 21 rejections, which to me was what the economists call a market signal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that perhaps that wasn't the right place to. And then I applied for a job at this, this, uh, this right-wing magazine in Bloomington, Indiana called The American Spectator. And I had never heard of it, but I got a copy of the, I, I wrote away and got them to send me a job application. And you filled out the first page, which was like, your name and stuff. And the second page was a whole like two pages. And the question was, why do you want to work at the American Spectator? Now I had no idea since I had never read the magazine. Or anything. So I just wrote, doesn't everyone want to work at the American mm. Spectator? Mailed in my application, of course got the job because you know, like who doesn't like a little smart ass? Uh, who doesn't want to hire a smart ass for, I think they were offering $9,000 a year at that point. Um, so I kind of, uh, this was 1984. I was 20 years old. I couldn't even drink. I was living in Bloomington, Indiana. I'm Canadian. I was, uh, it was just, I just kind of like, that's how it began. And I lost that job after six months. And I went to DC and was a 
an illegal immigrant and just kind of freelanced and, um, you know, ended up at the Washington Post and ended up at the New Yorker and then started to write a lot of books. It's just been this kind of, there's no plan, but I just liked telling stories and liked um, listening to people is really the thread that runs through, um, you know, and this, the current, this Paul Simon thing is, it's just, it's really just, we went, I meet this famous guy who's really brilliant with my, me and my friend Bruce, my oldest friend in the world, we go and we sit down and we basically just have, we just talk with him for, on 10 separate sessions of four hours each, we just sit down and talk to him. And like, it was just the most fun, natural, but it was a continuation of really what I've been doing my whole life, which is find interesting people and listen to them talk and ask them questions. Um, in his case, he just happens to be more interesting than most of the people I've ever interviewed, but it's the same process. Um, and it's sort of what, you know, my mom was a therapist and my dad was a great listener, one of the great listeners I've ever met in my life. So I just grew up with people who liked to listen to other people. Um, that was our, the Gladwell superpower was that we didn't talk much, we let other people do the talking. Sounds like the opposite of the Corolla superpower, by the way. Um, well, it's interesting. My mom and dad don't talk. Oh, it's just you. Just me. Yeah. Oh, I see. My my mom is not a talker at all, and my dad's a very low key talker. So there's yeah. not. Yeah. It's interesting. Oh, so you zigged and I zagged in response to parental influence. Yeah. I'm I, just. I did the opposite of everything my parents did because I saw that, you know, it's, it's sort of a Freakonomics thing. I looked at him and went, these people are wildly unsuccessful. I should essentially just build my model to be exactly the opposite of what they're doing. So yeah. I wasn't inspired by them. I was sort of negatively inspired by them. But I, I've always yeah. had it in my head, what would they do? And then I would do the opposite. And it, you know, ended up being a pretty successful strategy. There's some famous line from Freud about this, that every child makes, at a certain point in his or her development, makes that decision. Am I going to reject or copy the parental um, example? And it's you, yes, you, like I said, you zigged, I zagged. We both ended up okay. I I concur. The uh, Something that popped in my head is I was sort of thinking about your process and you know, what led you to Freakonomics? Which oh, no, no, Adam. Freakonomics is, um, I'm revisionist history. Freakonomics is uh, Dubner and Levitt. Oh, did I just fuck that up royally? No, no, no. It's funny. It was funny you did, though, because I'll explain to you why tons of people do this. Oh, and the good. reason they do it is that from the <laughs> moment people started to make that mistake, I would never correct them. Oh. Thinking correctly, I think, that this would rebound to my advantage. So what happened was... When the book Freakonomics came out, I knew yeah. Stephen Levitt a little bit, and he said, would you give me a blurb? And I said, sure. And he said, do you mind if he put the blurb? Usually blurbs go on the back of a book. Mm -hmm. He said, do you mind if he put it on the front of the book? And I said, sure. That sounds like an even better idea. What happened was that people saw my name on the front of the book and thought I wrote it. <laughs> and then this went on for years, and the book was insanely successful. So I was like, I am never going to correct anyone who says I did Freakonomics. This is, it's a fantastic book. These guys have a reputation for being really, really smart. Some portion of America thinks I wrote it. This is like, this is like if people, this is like if you were a movie director and everyone was under the impression that you directed The Godfather. Right. And they would say, like, you know, you're doing commercials for Target, and everyone thinks that you did the Godfather. Like that's the that's the analogy here. Would you correct them? No, of course you wouldn't. You you would say this is amazing. I'm not. Yeah, everyone that. thinks you're the man who <laughs> killed Jesse James. Or something. Yeah, would right. you Would you be at a cocktail party in the Old West trying to convince them you know no, you weren't you, that guy? You, okay, you would let it go. So you would I let it go. I apologize. No, 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 I, no. Don't apologize. I started off incredibly embarrassed, and now I'm just at a three. <laughs> But I must have seen your name on the front of, on the front yes. of it. But so, but you still, I mean, with things like revisionist history, you still, you, I feel like you guys travel in some of the same circles intellectually and and things like that. And it's a, yeah. it's a kind of a wanting to understand what motivates people and and how humans work. 
And yeah. and I most people aren't very interested in that subject. And something that popped into my mind, and you can tell me if this makes sense to you. Um, people know the story of years ago, I was working construction. I had a pickup truck. Uh, the only th- I had no insurance on my pickup truck, and the only thing that was good about the pickup truck is it had a expensive digital Sony radio in it mm-hmm. back in the 80s when everyone got their stereo stolen by smashing in the side window and pulling the stereo out. Everyone I knew who had a decent stereo in their car got it ripped off You know, between 1985 and 1989. That's what they did. Uh, I had no insurance. I had no uh, protected parking. I had nowhere to park it but on the streets of Hollywood, and I knew it wouldn't make it two nights. And so I spray painted it brown. And the reason I spray painted it brown is because I figured out that anyone who steals the stereo is selling it immediately to get drugs. And if I desecrate it by painting it brown, they'll not have any resale for this stereo. Nice. And yeah. I essentially desecrated my own. Now, I put a little piece of tape over the digital readout on it, and all the buttons and everything worked. It just was brown now. It looked like hell. Uh, Stereo was never stolen. Truck was stolen a couple of times. I had a fuel cutoff switch in it, so I was able to retrieve it each time. Each time it was stolen, they didn't steal the stereo. So it it proved my point that my desecration of my own stereo prevented this, this stereo from being stolen. But I first had to get inside the head of a stereo thief and think to myself, they don't steal it so they can use it. They steal it so they can sell it immediately to get drugs. It's a desperate act. Yeah. yeah. And they're this, not interest, th- yes. This will prevent that. Now, I've gotten a lot of I get I get to keep my stereo because I figured out how stereo thieves work in advance. And I feel yeah. like it's a little metaphor for an approach to life that could be helpful. You can keep more of your stereos. Well, first of all, if I were you, I would reflect on the fact that you have a natural affinity for figuring out how stereo thieves, drug-addled stereo thieves of the 1980s think. That's my that specialty. Should pause. <laughs> that, should, that should give you some pause. That should give you some pause. You should wonder a little bit about your upbringing. Um, but uh, no, you're, you know, you're, that's a kind of second order. You're absolutely right. That is the kind of second order analysis that fascinates me. And also that fascinates the free economics guys. It's like the first layer is, you know, uh, what does the what does the uh, is to assume that the person who's stealing your stereo wants your stereo. The second order is to think, oh, actually, what are they going to do with the stereo? You know, who's the next customer? You're foiling the second the second layer of customer, which is like the that's the kind of boss move. Yeah, um, it's like funny. That. It's funny. I, I got pulled over by the cops shortly after that um, because my ignition had been pulled out and I was starting my truck with a screwdriver. But I had my fuel cutoff switch, so I knew they weren't going to steal it. So I just used the screwdriver and the cop saw the screwdriver and he thought I stole the truck. Anyway, he pulled me over and... Um, at some point, he went, what's with the brown stereo? And I said, I paint it brown so it wouldn't get stolen. And he just went, how's that going to stop it from getting stolen? <laughs> and so that was his, he was first level thinking, right? I said, yes. go. LA's finest. Go. <laughs> they get one, they go one layer deep. I said, go, <laughs> right. go one deeper with me. I'll tell you why. And of course, he knew better. He knew more than anyone that these guys rip the stereos out, sell them to their fans, get their hit of drugs. You know, I mean, he knew yeah, that. As soon yeah. as I said second level and explained that, he was like, oh my God, you're a genius. He like, he literally. Wait, wait, can, you, can you answer this question? I've never understood this. So, for a huge period of time, hundreds of years, thousands of years, but right up until like the 90s, there's a class of people who make their living stealing stuff. Stereos out of cars, uh, breaking into homes and making off with the television or the, you know, the air conditioning unit. Or, and I feel like a lot of that has simply gone away. And I wondered, what do those guys do for cash now? So just yeah. in the car stereo market, like, you're absolutely right. There was this window. There was a period of time when if you had a stereo in your car, it was only a matter, and you parked your car in the street, it was only a matter of time before you lost it. 
And remember, you could take the stereo out, the, the removable ones. Yeah, I mean, for, you... for those of for those who may not remember and think maybe we're overstating the case, they made stereos you could physically pull out of the car and carry them like a lunch bu- bucket yes. into the restaurant. And or then they refined it to the ones where the face just popped off. You pop yes. the face so of the stereo disabled. off. Right. And then you would strap one of those metal... Um, do you remember those metal, big the, metal the club, lock thing? The club. The club that you would strap on your steering wheel, right? right? So this is, this is. I was going through exactly this in Washington D.C. and probably the same in the same um, time frame. But I would. What is what is that guy doing for money now? I feel like a couple of things. You've been hearing about these stories in L.A. at least, where people see a guy out to dinner with his wife at a Beverly Hills eatery wearing a big fat Rolex and the bad guys follow them back to the house kind of thing. And when they get out in the driveway, they go, give me the Rolex. I I feel like there's a little bit of that. There's also a whole kind of maybe that guy's retired, but his grandkids are doing identity theft now. Like there's a kind of tech next gen version they're moving yeah like you know la or sorry i think california had i don't know 36 billion dollars of covid relief that was just taken by people from their prison cells and from other countries and stuff like they've they've high teched it you know what i mean they've kind of done what you know you know it, it's sort of like but, the cartels are doing fentanyl now they're not doing weed anymore you know they evolve but the reason but what this is doesn't answer my question though on some level is the guy who would smash your car window and grab your stereo did that because he didn't have the intelligence the education the motivation the what have you to do to make his money legitimately but now you're saying that same guy is so smart all of a sudden in the last 25 years he's like he can code and do identity theft. Like No, no, wait. I'm not saying that. I'm saying his kid is. <laughs> oh, I see. I think he's retired or he OD'd or he's in prison. But okay. yeah, not the same dude, not the smash and grab. No, but the dude. same kind of dude. You're saying the criminal class has gotten that part of the criminal cl- class has gotten a lot smarter in the last 25 years. I think criminals are motivated they're they're sort of I've always thought of criminals as kind of a leaf that's just sort of floating. You know, when someone washes their car up the hill and you see that stream of water coming down mm-hmm. and you just see it kind of finding its way down the street, it doesn't stay in a straight line. It always kind of looks for the low point, you know. I I believe criminals. So for me, my thing with painting my stereo was this isn't going to prevent you from having your stereo stolen if there are no other choices of stereos to be stolen. It's only <laughs> going to prevent it if there's a car parked in front of you and behind you that doesn't have a painted. This is the bear problem, right? Right. You, just, you don't need to be faster than the bear. You need to be faster than your friend. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was a Walter Payton, Matt Suey description of this. That he was the fullback, Walter Payton, of course, is Walter Payton, and he was basically explaining you just have to be faster than Matt Suey. What, way to pluck Matt Suey from the Wayback Machine. That was, that was, imp- I haven't thought about Matt Suey in literally 30 years. Penn State. Yeah. Yeah. He was, it, 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 they had a wonderful relationship with Peyton. They were like best friends. Matt Suey's still, still going strong. Peyton yeah, yeah. Uh, tragically passed, it's coming on 20 years now, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. But my feeling with criminals is, they don't want to get cut by broken glass or shot by an owner or bit by a dog. They're, and, and here's an interesting theory for you. A lot of criminals are, 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 are pretty lazy. Like they don't want to just get up, shave, put on a tire, like get a job. There's education and background. There's a bunch of factors, but I just mean they're looking for kind of paths of least resistance and sitting home and hacking into people's accounts versus getaway cars and shooting it out with the cops and stuff. It's just an easier, safer proposition. Yeah, yeah. I'm always impressed by the fact as well that the old class of criminal, you know, they'd break in and you would say, well, you know, some guy robbed my apartment last night and they made off with the TV and the jewelry. In the 70s, your TV was like 
a hundred pounds. <laughs> right? Oh my God. I, I would, like, yeah. In the eighties and nineties too. I mean, the whole yeah, flat these, panel thing, pretty new. These things are enormous and incredibly heavy. And they're what they're going down the two flights of stairs in my walk up with this 80 pound TV. Like it was, it's like a seriously challenging. It's like they have to be, they must be lifting on their off days. These, these guys. I once, uh, had a guy, you know, I work construction, so they would always steal tools. Tools are like one yeah. of the number one things that folks steal. And I had this big iron 15 inch blade chop saw back when nothing was aluminum and everything was just iron. And this thing must have weighed 250 pounds. And I saw this little guy just running down the street, had it up on his shoulder. You know, it was like in the back of my truck and turn my head and look, and this guy's right. I mean, it's like literally like taking an anvil. It's like a strongman competition where they throw the keg over yeah. the fence or yeah. pull the bus with their teeth. It's interesting what adrenaline and desperation mixed together can create. It's a superpower. Yeah. That sounds a lot like it's like a national sport of Scotland. You know, there's, <laughs> the Highland Games. You know, like it's one of those. It's a version. It's a. It's the urban version of the Highland Games. Instead of throwing like, what do they call it? The cable. Yeah. They they, they pick up construction tools. Yeah, and and, and, and see how far that how how many paces they can get down Van Nuys Boulevard with them. So. Uh, <laughs> Paul Simon, I don't have any, I met him at a cocktail party once at Edie Brickell, are they, they're yeah, married, right? They are married. They're yes, still they married. married? They've been. Yes, they are. Happily, yes. God, it must be 35 years or 30 years or something. I mean, they've been, yeah, they've chosen, feel like they've yeah. been together for, uh, for a long time. Uh, Paul seems like a great storyteller on stage and through song, if you really think about his songs, yeah. their stories, but doesn't always mean they're great storytellers when they're good, when they get off the stage, but he is. He is. I mean, that's one of the things we discovered in doing Miracle, Miracle, Miracle and Wonder. Um, Cause I was nervous about that. You know, you're right. People, just because you're good in one domain doesn't mean you're good in, there are lots of people who are fantastic writers and terrible talkers. There are people who are f fantastic musicians who can't, you know, tell a story, you know, it's, so I was, con you know, that was the, the gamble. And we go and we meet with him. And then there's the question, well, will we enjoy each other's company? Because to do a book like this, we needed a lot of material. We really wanted hours and hours and hours and hours of tape. But if he hated us, that wasn't gonna be possible. Um, and he was so, every one of my fears was dispelled. He was so charming and so un, so on Rockstar, I told the story before, like one of the things we did in this book, this is this hilarious contrast. We have, you know, much of the book is us talking with Paul and Paul playing and explaining, and me like giving theories about Paul. We also said to Paul, give us a list of peers, musician peers, who we can call up, who can talk about your music. So we call up Herbie Hancock and Joan Baez. And, and one of the people that I, Paul told me to call was Sting. Mm -hmm. So call up Sting, it's on a Zoom call. He is, of course, in a chateau in France. And over his shoulder, there's what looks like, you know, I mean, God, no, it looked like a Picasso or something, something extravagantly expensive. And no part of this was surprising to me. I was like, first of all, you're gonna call Sting, of course he's going to be in a French chateau, and of course there's gonna be a Picasso over his shoulder. And Sting proceeds to, first of all, I have, I think never in my life been intimidated by interviewing someone except for Sting. Oh, really? I was like, I couldn't say a word. I was just sort of sat there. He was not because I'm a huge police fan. I'm not really. He's just such a rock star. On the rock star scale, I would say he's he is a clear 10. He's well, just Well, yeah, I I agree. First off, it'd be funny if you called Sting and he was like, "Uh, Malcolm, I'm having sex. I'll call you back in 13 hours." <laughs> yes, that's right. That would not that's, surprise me either. That's part that of his resume. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the thing about it is, is you go, you you think to yourself, well, there's Gene Simmons from Kiss, but it's like he's kind of a comic book sort of central yeah. casting version of a rock star, which might work on some people. But I think for 
people that are wired like yourself, you kind of see through that veneer. But Sting feels like the real deal. Sting is the, and he proceeds to tell a story about, um, I think American Tune, if memory serves. He comes to America for the first time with the police and the kind of theme song of their visit to America, they've all coming to America for the first time, is American Tune, the great um, Paul Simon song. And they cross the country and this is the soundtrack of their trip. And he tells this story so perfectly and beautifully. It's like, it's like he had done 20 versions of it and had, you know, workshopped it and to perfection. And halfway through, foolishly, I blurt out something and he he goes, ah, 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 meaning let the master finish his amazing story before you ask your foolish question. And I was so like, I was like, first of all, why did I say anything? This thing, everything was going perfectly. There was no need for me to intervene. And the other thing I noticed was, and this is this is actually a, an incredibly endearing insight. I noticed while Sting was talking that he was glancing off screen at something. And I realized that he had made notes in preparation for our conversation. In other words, you realize that there is, it's not some accidental, magical, um, you know, uh, uh, intrinsic quality of being a mega rock star. He does the work. He was gonna have a random telephone call with me that was gonna last, or a Zoom call, it's gonna last 25 minutes about somebody, not even his own music, about somebody else. And it was gonna, you know, he's in a French chateau drinking, you know, 1921 Chateau Lafitte or whatever the he's, hell he's doing. He like takes time to prepare for the interview, which I was just so, I don't know why I was so impressed by that. It just seemed like no other, what other massive rock star does that? He doesn't have to do, but anyway, my point about this is, Staying's at one end of the continuum, Paul Simon's at the other. He is the most unassuming, like approachable. We were, we started off doing these um, interviews in Hawaii and the, where he was. And so we went to Hawaii and the closest studio we could find was this one way up in the hills and like an hour from where he lived. <clears throat> and we waited for him the first day and then he shows up driving himself in like one of those little Teslas. And I'm like, wait a minute, he drove him. He's never a driver. I just couldn't comprehend the fact that a rock star of this magnitude was driving himself an hour into the hills of Hawaii to meet with us in some little rundown studio. It's very so typical. My point is he defined all my expectations about what I thought a rock star was. He wasn't the Sting version, although I love the Sting version. He's his own kind of like, there's something sort of very, um, uh, what's the word I want? I don't know what the word is I want. It's, it's some, it, it's almost as if um, he would, he treated, he, I know what it is. It's that he approaches his music in the same kind of matter of fact, professional way that your accountant does. Mm -hmm. Which is not to diss accountants or this way of doing it. It's a, it's a profession for him. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about that, because while you were talking about Sting preparing for this thing, you know, I think about I just did a show with uh, Jay Leno and mm -hmm. I've done plenty of shows with plenty of people. None of them are successful comedically and or as rich or whatever as Jay Leno. But Jay Leno is the only one who will call me the day before and go, what do you want to talk about? Here's some ideas. Here's some thoughts. He'll show up two hours early. Like, yeah. he, you, you think to yourself, yeah, come on, you're Jay Leno. What are, you, what are you burning all these calories for? And then you realize, oh, that's how you become Jay Leno. Yeah. And, and you can't turn it off. And, you can't turn it off. And I'm like going, uh, t I, I would... Interestingly enough, I'm going uh, tonight out to uh, celebrate Jimmy Kimmel's birthday. Jimmy Kimmel has that same kind of work ethic, you know, and mm -hmm. that sort of preparation and whatever you're talking about with Sting. And if you kind of think about it, there's plenty of funny people. You know, I don't know where Jay, Jay's funny, Jimmy's funny, 
Sting's talented. There's a lot of really good musicians out there. Like, it's not all just God-given whatever. There's a whole Mm -hmm. bunch of work involved with it. And I think that is what separates those guys from the folks you've never heard of that are just doing open mics right now somewhere on a Wednesday night or playing playing an acoustic set at Largo versus being sting like it's and and I think we do ourselves a disservice as a society when we sit back and we go oh god given yeah, it's, he's just he's touched by god or he's got that talent he's got that we don't really dig we don't really peel that onion and go he worked very hard for this there was a whole bunch of decisions he made that were the right decision that got him he's still doing mm-hmm. it today at age I don't know 68 or whatever you know, Sting is. 78. Is he that oh, Sting, old? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, Sting's, Sting's in the 60s, but uh, Paul Simon's uh, 78. And Leno's and 72. And he's still showing up yeah. early, and he still wants to prove it, and he's still prepared. And it's not a coincidence that these that we're talking about these guys right now versus I don't know who you're talking about. And I, I wonder if, yeah. if as... Society, we're, we're so quick to just chalk things up to luck or who you know or talent or something. We don't we forget re- about this we, element. Yeah. Well, and not we, only do we forget about it, I don't think we want to get into it because it's somehow a little bit shaming to the rest of us who aren't putting that time in. Yeah. You know, this, this ties into actually one of the things that really that I wanted to explore with, with Miracle and Wonder, which was... To me, the most extraordinary thing about Paul Simon is his longevity. So he has his first hit in the 1950s when he's in high school, and then he is musically relevant. He is absolutely at the center of the popular music conversation in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then continues to make great music beyond that, but he's relevant for 40 years. And you cannot, I mean, the number of people in pop music who are relevant for 40 years is, I mean, it's basically Paul Simon. I mean, there are people who continue to play their old hits, but he's making new music that's, and I was trying to figure out, one of the ideas I had as I thought about it since then is that I think that in all fields of great endeavor, we tend to underestimate the value of longevity and overestimate the value of peak performance. Mm. So think about this model Let's pick basketball. You could have a peak performance model where you say, I think the greatest player is uh, Jordan because Jordan in the years, you know, 2000 and whatever, and and you pick a year. He had two years or three years where he was incandescent, couldn't be touched. That's the peak model. Or you can say, well, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is one of the three best players in the game, stretching from when he was 22 to when he was 42. Or you can do it in baseball. You can say the greatest baseball player of all time is fill in the blanks, Willie Mays, whatever. Or you can say, actually, Hank Aaron is hitting 40 some odd home runs a year every year for 20 years. He is never at any, he's very rarely the greatest player in the game for any stretch of time, but over 20 years, there's no one else who's year in, year out touching him. And it goes to, so Hank Aaron has a different, or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Paul Simon, have a different approach to their craft and a different set of gifts than the people who have maximum peak performance. And part of, one of the gifts is what you're just talking about, which is they have a motivation and a work ethic that is just an order of magnitude different from everybody else that sustains them over a long period of time. You know. Leno, most people who are 72 and have made as much money as he does, he has, just pack it in at a certain point, right? And the whole point about him is he just doesn't, he can't do that. Paul Simon can't, he's still making music. He keeps trying to quit with this hilarious part of the book where he's talking about how he tried, he thought he was done. And then he like wakes up in the middle of the night one morning and there's a song in his head. He's like, mm. oh, I guess I'm not done. And now he's, you know, now he's making music. You know, like, it's like, these guys, they can't stop, right? It's, it's not... Yeah, well, I I do want to talk this sort of, I I want to drill down on this peak performance versus the kind of longevity thing, because I have Mm -hmm. have many thoughts and I'm I'm very interested in it. I would argue Matt Suey, greatest running back. Oh, no. Okay. We'll take a quick break. (laughs) 
just a call back. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell's with us for a quick break. Be right back with him right after this. Malcolm Gladwell is with us. Uh, auto, oh, sorry, audio biography, Miracle and Wonder, Conversations with Paul Simon. Uh, and you can get that uh, on Amazon and where? Because I don't want to screw it up again. Audible. Get it Audible or you can get it directly from us at uh, miracleaudio.com. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm very much interested in the marathon versus the sprint. And I've, I've really noticed it because I had, I had this thought the other day, which is I've been doing this for 25 years plus. And I'm like, I've known Jimmy. I started with Jimmy Kimmel in 1994. We weren't really successful in 1994, but that's when we started and I'm going to his birthday. He's very successful. And I, I thought, I think we both had a kind of marathon mentality approach mm -hmm. to it, but with moments of some peak performance in there, not so much me, but you know, Jimmy's hosted the Oscars a couple of times. Yeah. And, and I, I, I started, and, and, and in that time, I've seen so many people come and go, especially in the comedy world, but the music world, I work for K rock radio, I've seen these acts that were huge, gone, huge and gone. Like there's so much of that. And I'm trying to kind of think, what what is that? They had the talent comedically to get there, or musically to get there. Some of it is a societal thing, I suppose. But I don't know. I'm interested in your thoughts. A everyone wants to hang around. They want to keep doing it. Paul Simon, Jay Leno, Jimmy Kimmel, they're able to do it. What is, mm -hmm. what is, what is well, to that? S Simon is an interesting example of this because, you know, he... He, he, he never stops this process of experimentation. Every time you experiment, you take a risk, right? You're, you're taking a risk of failure. And the reason successful people stop experimenting is that the, the, the possibility of failure is, to their mind, um, far riskier than, the, than the, the necessity of some new kind of success. They already have success. They're like, why, why would I bother? Why would I take a risk? I'm already, it already works. Mm -hmm. And what Simon, what's fascinating about his career is the number of times that he kind of reinvents himself. Yeah. You know, he's a folk singer with Art Garfunkel. And then he just, he and Art Garfunkel stop being a duo and he goes out and becomes a, you know, everyone associates the two of them. The two of them are the brand, right? And he's like, you know what, I'll just do it by myself for a while. And then he stops being a pure folky and starts to experiment with R&B and with reggae. And, and then like he does a Broadway musical and it's a flop. And what does he do? He, he goes to, a, he, he, you know, he just reinvents himself again. He goes to, goes to South Africa and does Graceland, which is in the context of the politics of the time, an insane risk. Nobody was, it was, an, it was an outlaw state. You know, everyone thought that, that you, People think differently now, but at the time, maybe people thought that he was, you know, violating the UN boycott on the apartheid regime of South Africa. Mm -hmm. He's just kind of never, st even today when we were talking to him, he was in the middle of working on something that was, once again, a departure from what he had been trying. It's that kind of ceaseless experimentation and that willingness to take chances that is a huge part of it. I, I'm always reminded of... Um, you know, Tiger Woods uh, would periodically, and I don't play golf, but I was always fascinated by this. You know, he would, he'd win like whatever, X number of majors. And then he would say, and I'm over the off season, I'm gonna be revamping my swing. Mm -hmm. And it would take like, there would be like six months where he couldn't win anything because he was working on his swing. And everyone would always say, would always say why, why would Tiger Woods revamp his swing? He's the greatest golf from the world. What on earth is he doing experimenting with some new way of hitting a golf ball? But now I get it, which is that Tiger understood that the way you stay on top is that you, you ceaselessly experiment. You, the, if things are going well, that's exactly when you should experiment with your swing, right? Yeah. If you experiment with your swing when things are going badly, when you're a disaster, then you're doing it out of weakness. You should do it out of strength. You should be like, I need a new, I, re, I understand that even though that things are great right now, I need 
there needs to be a new iteration of Tiger Woods if I'm going to stay on top. Yeah, I, I, but I also wonder about general motivation, which is I think some people are attracted to the business because they would like to be a star versus would like to create and be gainfully employed. I don't necessarily mean a humbler approach. I just mean Paul Simon seems like he's doing this because it's what he does and all the stuff that comes with it is is an ancillary byproduct yeah. of what he would be doing anyway. And yes. um and there's sort of like I met comedians that, you know, it's like I'll do it but you got to pay me, but I don't really want to do it, you know, and it's like they of course their career is oftentimes shorter because they don't they don't love it or they're not mm -hmm. doing it anyway. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think Paul Simon would do it for free. I think Jay Leno would do it for free. I yeah. think that that's yeah. kind of, you want to know where where's the longevity. It's like, where's the longevity in you watching your favorite TV shows or eating your favorite meal or going to your favorite restaurant or seeing your old buddies or whatever it is. It's what you do. It's what you like to do. We don't question yeah. it. Of course, that's what you enjoy. That's what yeah, motivates yeah. you. We don't really think about that in terms of work, but I think that's what motivates these guys. I think I'm sure Paul Simon would be writing songs and doing what Paul Simon does in a vacuum of success. Yes. In fact, I, that's a good question. That I think you'd, never asked you'd him, be which... doing what you're doing in a vacuum of success as well, although it's altered because you have to work at a post office during the day, you know, kind of thing. But whatever these inclinations are, or I, you'd still be doing a version of what you're doing, I yes. think. Yes, yes. I think that's probably fair. Um, the, and that's always a good question to ask someone like him, which is what would have happened had you not had the immediate commercial success that you did? So what does your career look like if you were always a kind of middle of the middle of the road singer? You know, if you instead of selling 10 million albums, you sold 100,000 albums. What does that mean? How how would that have changed your trajectory? And I'm kicking myself. I never asked him that question. It would have been a great one. You know, I and I wonder about that. I also think but there's something I do think he'd be doing the exact same thing. I do think as well though that it would be very hard for him to think of a career in the absence of commercial success because a central part of his genius is the extent to which he has his finger on the kind of zeitgeist that he can't in a certain sense he can't make music that's not popular he it's like there's something that's like such a huge part of his He's not doing some, I don't think he ever conceived of what he was doing as some esoteric exercise that was just for his in, in his own personal gratification. He was always playing to an audience and trying to understand the sensibility of his uh, potential fans. Or, or his, um, And that's like, that commercial sense, I, I mean, I, I think that's kind of like, um, uh, unbelievably admirable and interesting. I love, whenever I meet people who I think have ge have a genuine commercial sense, I'm in awe of them. I just think, man, that's the hardest. The easiest thing in the, in the world is to go off and do what makes you happy. The harder thing is to do what makes you happy and also happens to make a hundred million people happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a, I, I know it's, it's something that as a person, you know, I don't think of myself as an artist, but I think most people that tell jokes or write songs think of themselves to some degree is working in the arts. And, you know, it's easy to have that knee jerk reaction where you go, oh, fuck the Kardashians. Come on, that's bullshit. And then there's another part of you that has to go, well, they figured out some sort of way Man, to capture, you know, 200 billion yeah. people on Facebook. And, I do, I do think of that. I oftentimes cite a logo. I think there's a genius in a logo. It's like uh -huh. people can be dismissive sometimes, but I think like the right logo 
is a, is a stroke of genius. The right colors, the right font, the right shape, you know, whatever, whatever that is, the ones you think of in your head that you can immediately, I just say logo and the top five that pop in your head, you know, and you, you just think you, you, I always think there's a genius to that because it's so simple yet it's the most complex thing in the world, you know? And I feel like mm. the zeitgeist you spoke about, whether you're a comedian or a songwriter in a way it's super simple and it's also the most sought after, most difficult, most interesting math equation in the world simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting as well because going back to the, this, going back to our discussion of longevity, and, I went, and it's, it's interesting in music, but also very much in your world because the thing about humor is how generationally specific it is. Um, you know, you, all of us have had the, have had the experience of watching a comic from 30 years ago. And it's like, it's just not, it doesn't seem funny at all. Like, it doesn't really matter who it is. It's rare. There's some exceptions to this, but like, or you watch like a, a movie, a comedy from the six fifties. A sitcom 60s. from the sixties. It's know. just unwatchable. Like you don't right. even, you can't even, so under those circumstances, when you're dealing in something that's that culturally specific, the idea that you would remain relevant for longer than a decade is nearly impossible. Right. Yes. Some so achievement in that kind of it's not like Procter and Gamble. People want from detergent in 2021 what they wanted from detergent in 1821. Right. It's not. Nothing has changed in that respect. But this is like. So if you're going to be a comic and you're going to remain relevant, you have to kind of move, understand what the zeitgeist is and move with it. And that, that's like, that's the thing that I don't, that I'm in awe, in awe of when I see it. I, mean, I see it with Paul Simon. I mean, he moved, you listen to his, you know, you listen to Sound of Silence, one of the first big hits he had, and you listen to something in Graceland and it's like, wait, the same guy did both those songs? Like, there's so much movement, creative movement over the course of that 30 year span, 25 year span. Well, if you wanna hear the whole thing told by first person, the person himself, Miracle and Wonder is the name of it. It's available now on Amazon and, sorry. Audible. 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 And miracleaudio.com. And Miracle Audio on the podcast, Revisionist History, is uh, where you can hear Malcolm as well. Uh, website, gladwell.com. Malcolm, always a, a pleasure, always a great conversation. Thanks for joining me here today. It's been really fun. Thanks. The Thank great you, Malcolm Gladwell. All right. Let me tell you about Simply Safe. Want your home to feel safer. There's nothing better. Uh, there's no better time than right now. This week, our friends at Simply Safe are giving Adam Carolla Show listeners early access to their Black Friday deal. 50% off everything you need. Indoor and outdoor cameras, comprehensive sensors, around-the-clock monitoring by trained professionals who send help the instant you need it. Name best home security system of 2021 by U.S. News and World Report. Easily customize the system for your home, and uh, you can do it online in minutes. Even get a free custom recommendation as well. Uh, they're uh, Simply Safe's biggest discounts of the year. So get a complete home security system starting at just over a hundred bucks with no long term contracts or commitments. Supplies are limited. Take 50% off at simply two eyes in there. Simply safe.com slash Adam today. All right. Live shows coming up, Brea Improv, December 15th. We're taping those. They're going to be specials. TJ Miller's going to be there, Patrick Warburton. You can uh, check out the um, Chassis channel on Pluto TV, 687. You can check out the Corolla Christmas combo. Perfect gift for uh, any fan. Go to CorollaDrinks.com. And until next time, Sam Kroll for Malcolm Gladwell and Dawson and Eleanor. Oh, that's right. Saying mahalo. He pulled me over and... Um, at some point he went, what's with the brown stereo? And I said, I paint it brown so it wouldn't get stolen. And he just went, how's that gonna stop it from getting stolen? <laughs> that was his, he was first level thinking, right? I said, yes. go. Ellie's finest. Go. <laughs> they get one, they go one layer deep.